again. Welcome to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. We're excited that you're able to Skype into us here so we can prick, pick your brain on all things media and politics today and President Trump. Um, you're often called to CNN, to Fox, to talk about Trump's interaction with the media. We were just talking with Jennifer Lawless down at American University uh, about the last kind of 24, 48 hours after this news about the... Uh, you know, information uh, leaked to the Russians, the denial, and then the admittance by President Trump. Let's just go back maybe to a very basic question, Merrill, as someone who knows the media, in the media. Given what we saw from the campaign with President Trump, did you expect this level of intrigue, chaos, if you will, with President Trump that we are seeing right now? Yes, it's, it's utterly predictable, Kate. Um, this is the way he ran business. This is the erratic way he handled much of his public life. Uh, he um, has rarely demonstrated the ability to manage in complex circumstances. He is an excellent marketer, but not a particularly organized or effective business person. So if you really have looked at his record carefully, and many people in New York have studied him over many years, this is not shocking. What is a little shocking is that he hasn't had the... Um, the competence to surround himself with people who would insulate him from this level of difficulty. And, you know, how do you contextualize sort of his relationship with the media? He's oftentimes had a very adversarial one, uh, Sean Spicer uh, not letting certain press into briefings, um, specifically calling them out. I mean, have we ever seen anything at this level anywhere in the States? Not at the not at the White House level. We've seen it on occasion from members of Congress or perhaps at the State House level. But this the tenor of these um, interactions uh, has never been seen before at uh, in the White House press room. And their threats about cutting off briefings or taking away credentials from people really defy any rationality because no one's ever wanted that kind of a fight with the national press, and they're obviously not winning this one either. Well, that was my next question. Does it not immediately put him behind the eight ball if he's uh, basically off-putting press to such a degree? I mean, let's look at the last 48 hours. His administration called that story by the Washington Post about the leaking of confidential information by the president himself to Russian officials. Uh, his administration called it false. And then he turns around the next day and admits it was true. Um, you know, is he doing this to, I mean, how does the press operate in such a, an environment? Well, the press is behaving, I think, by and large, extremely well. The people who run the New York Times and Washington Post, and that's in many cases what we're talking about, because they are driving the news agenda to an extraordinary degree. They are behaving very prudently. Keep in mind that the Washington Post chose not to release more details on the clandestine operation yesterday. I'm not uh, up to the minute on what's transpired, but I, I see that the New York Times has now uh, released the name of the country in question, which is Israel. Um, but I think the press has behaved very prudently. But I got to tell you, I was in Washington last week, yeah. and one of the things that comes across to me in conversations with the press is that the level of stress uh, on, on national news organizations, whether it's NPR or Washington Post or New York Times, is enormous right now. And it's going to be very difficult to sustain this level of activity just from an energy point of view. One of the things that's suffering from this is that there's so much pressure around the daily happenings that there are a lot of extraordinary stories in government right now, what's going on uh, on behalf of cabinet appointees and others in the administration, that that's not being covered and that's a problem. Absolutely. It's one of the things we just discussed with Jennifer Lawless. A lot of these things happen in media vacuums, and as you just pointed out, things aren't being paid attention to elsewhere. We spoke with Daryl West of Brookings, who did point out that the low, low percentage number of appointments made by the president so far, the shockingly no low number, that as you mentioned, has just not been reported on. So, you know, looking at the media, looking at the president, do you think that he's completely cognizant of this fact and using it to his advantage to have these um, big media firestorms? I think his people are using it to their advantage. They are going about the business of changing the nature of the federal government and how it, um, how it interacts with the public of this country in a very profound way. 
And to the point about it not being covered, it's not being covered, but there's a lot going on. To your point about appointments, um, we're not having an actual debate about that. And they are, in effect, by default, weakening the capability of the federal government to carry out policies that uh, they're, they're apparently opposed to, but that have majority support in this country. So the aftermath of this is not going to be very easy to unwind, but I think we'll come out of this at some point soon and hopefully have a national debate about changing the nature of the federal government. That's a relatively big story, I would think, Kate. Uh, again, specifically the, the cabinet appointments, or are you looking at a, even a broader picture, Merrill? No, a, a broader picture. I mean, at the Federal Communications Commission, they're changing the entire regulation of the Internet and doing so overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, the State Department is a ghost town. Uh, they're changing the nature of what goes on at the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency in terms of regulations there. They're, they're moving very dramatically to make change, even as the White House looks, you know, feckless and, um, and not particularly functioning well. And, and we've seen such statements um, from former President Obama to such effect. And here we are, you know, past the 100-day mark for the, the Trump administration. Um, you know, the things that are happening right now, people ask, as you said, things that are being undone. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Can they ever be redone if there's perhaps a new administration in 2020? Well, the, the challenge of that is, you know, just to take the FCC as an example, it took a long time to build consensus around the uh, internet uh, regulatory scheme mm. that's in place now because the Democrats traditionally don't fall in the line as easily as Republicans do. Mm. So the, the question of a united Democratic Party around policy initiatives is, you know, not necessarily the norm. In the Republican Party and in this administration, people have fallen in the line from both a legislative point of view and a regulatory point of view, and they're making things happen very quickly. Undoing that when the Democrats are, are uh, struggle to build consensus is another matter altogether. And, you know, let's talk as we, you know, are here in the spring of 17, obviously 18, we're talking midterms. How do you see what's playing out in Washington right now, um, especially from the media standpoint? Uh, you know, is 18 just going to be uh, a new, uh, a whole new world order, the new frontier based under this administration? And, you know, especially Republicans uh, who are facing uh, uh, some, some battles. I mean, how are they going to be able to uh, maneuver this, again, new, new frontier? Well, Kate, we're, you know, 120 days in here, and much of what's transpired has been surprising and unpredictable. It is really hard to predict what the next 120 days or the 120 days after that holds. But I think it's fair to say that we're seeing Republicans peel off already. In the last few days, there have been significant uh, challenges to the, to the solid um, majority that the Republicans have kept together. Uh, Democrats are getting more and more outspoken. More of them are talking about impeachment uh, and aggressive hearings on the Russia matter. So the coalitions that we thought would be in the current state they were in January are changing very, very rapidly. And one would think if Trump said 36 percent or lower when we get into <clears throat> next year, uh, the Democrats will win at least one House of Congress in the election. But this is all changing so quickly, and in the media environment we're in, and in the White House environment we're in, you know, who knows what's ahead? It's highly likely there'll be conflict uh, around the North Korea matter, uh, in the Middle East, and, and we know that usually countries rally behind presidents in times of conflict, so there's that part of it to, to consider. So there are so many pieces to this puzzle. The, the prediction market is very difficult right now. A couple more questions while we have you here, because I'm, I'm loving picking your brain here, Merrill. Let's go back a little bit to the press access in the White House. Um, these instances that we've seen of press being shut out, the particular instance that we just saw when Russian officials were at the Oval Office after Trump had fired Comey, that they allowed Russian press in, but not the United States press. Is there a tipping point? Is there a point if we see more aggressive uh, behavior from the Trump administration towards press that we will see a backlash or at least, at least some sort of action, as you said, you think that the press has been behaving prudently until this point, but you know, can you only push the press so far? Well, they're pushing a lot of people so far, uh, very hard, 
are right now. You know, congressional investigations are accelerating because, in part because, investigators are frustrated uh, with the lack of responsiveness of the administration and the kinds of things Trump has said. The leaks of yesterday about the uh, matter with the Russian diplomats occurred because of a frustrated diplomatic corps who leaked um, uh, the conversations in the White House very quickly uh, after they happened and after they rippled through the government. You can't, um, uh, in effect, dump on uh, investigators like this, whether they be congressional or at the State Department or, um, or in the law enforcement agencies, and not expect a response. TV uh, over the last few days has been full of FBI alum or representatives of the FBI warning against a war against the FBI, which sounds like an almost impossible thing to imagine, but it's a bit of what's happening right now. The President of the United States is at war with the bureaucracy of the FBI, and that's another war he can't win. So then you let layer the media into all that, who are beneficiaries of this to a certain extent, because the story keeps getting better. The leaks keep getting more profound, like yesterday's um, extraordinary leak of a conversation in the Oval Office. And that's just an, a, an axis of power that is going to be very hard for a weakened president with 36 percent support among the public and very limited, actually passionate and intimate support in Congress. That's not a good prognosis at all. And, you know, to kind of wrap up what you had mentioned before about the ability of press to cover everything that's going on, but it's also the appetite of the American public as well. Um, you know, how do we see this as sort of the balance of sort of the reporting uh, of, of the policy and reporting of the, of the governmental actions that's necessary? Does the public necessarily have an appetite for it when they're given, as you said, all of this, all of this, you know, juicy Russian entry FBI? Is it is it a difficult place for press to be to be able to report, you know, that again, either have the time or capacity, or even have the public be interested in it? The metrics uh, around that: uh, subscriptions to newspapers, uh, cable news watching, and broadcast news watching would suggest the public is fascinated right now. I think that cuts across ideological lines. People are watching both Fox and MSNBC in significant numbers. This is, uh, Kate, as you know and have observed, this is a pretty good story, as stories go. Nobody would be paying attention to any of this had uh, a TV star not been, ele been elected president and had a former uh, Secretary of State been elected president instead. So news consumption right now, for better or for worse, is being driven by a celebrity story and a celebrity misbehavior, and there's nothing people like more than that. So I think the ability of people to consume this stuff is going to continue as long as the storylines stay as critical and as dramatic as they've been for the past 120 days or so. And what do you have to say? To, let's just, you know, to wrap this up, let's maybe bring fake news in here a little bit, Meryl. Um, the, 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 even the, the coining the term of fake news, uh, a lot of times you see reactions that people call news fake simply because they don't agree with it. What's your take on fake news? Is it going to continue to be in jargon? Are people going to continue to uh, point to it and, and make it something that folks are sort of wary of? Uh, again, you know, there are legitimate fake news stories, but then there's also kind of the pejorative use of the term when maybe it might not even be applicable. You know, how's fake news going to continue to to play on now in this administration? I think there's been an awakening in the news industry and among sophisticated news consumers about the risks of fake news. I think people are getting smarter about it from a consuming point of view, and I'm happy to report that uh, those of us in the business are quite aware of efforts by Facebook and Google at a minimum to be on top of fake news and develop tools for consumers that help them sort it out. So um, I I'm more optimistic than I was a few months ago about our ability to improve the fake news situation and get behind it and get people cognizant of what they're looking at. So I'm pretty optimistic uh, about all that. And look, the real news, if you will, is so intriguing, <laughs> it almost feels like the fake, fake news is obscured because the real stories are so compelling. Because you, you just can't make this up. So Meryl Brown, I appreciate your Skyping in today. Any last parting thoughts to folks here in Rhode Island as we're talking about media at the national level and we're bringing it to them right here at the local level? Things to keep an eye on moving forward or things that you'd like to point out? 
Well, I, just to follow up on that last point, um, the, the media environment right now, um, with so much media and so many people having access to media all the time on, um, on their phones, wherever they go, it's really important that we all be sophisticated consumers and that we think seriously about what it is we're consuming. And I don't care whether it's from traditional media, broadcast media, New York Times, NBC News, whatever it is, we all have to look at things with a skeptical eye and with a refined eye so that we're not drawn in to the irrelevance of the moment and to, to as you put it before, Kate, the prevalence of fake news. So one of the things we're talking about a lot in the academic world and the people who study these things is the question of how do we make people more sophisticated? And I think people like you and me, as we talk about these issues, insisting that people focus on what they're reading, consuming, and watching is really important in today's cluttered environment. So that would be the thing I hope people will take seriously. Well, I hope folks take that away from our conversation today with Merrill Brown, former director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State. You'll see him on national news, and if you saw him here at Go Local, you'll remember his uh, extolling you to be discerning when you're uh, consuming media, and there's no shortage of it today. So, Merrill Brown, appreciate your Skyping in.